Hello everyone and welcome to a new short episode from the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we are looking at the monster of Patridge Creek. From the 1908 short story The Monster of Patridge Creek by French author Georges Dupuy, at times considered to be a cryptid. The monster, not the author. Before we start, I'd like to thank Chase Tosh, who suggested this one in the comments. I do take into account all suggestions, so feel free to place yours in the comments below. Now let's get into it. Two million years ago, during the Pleistocene, a large predator evolved from northern hemisphere canids. As smaller mammals can find it troublesome to retain heat in a colder environment, this predator found an environmental advantage in increasing in size, which helped it prey on some of the biggest terrestrial mammals the world has ever seen, the woolly mammoth. As this canid further adapted to taking down big prey, its forelimbs became better suited to grabbing, in order to manipulate prey and more easily bite the neck or snout to asphyxiate it. Eventually, the forelimbs abandoned their cursorial function in favor of remaining free for the hunt, and thus this predator became completely bipedal, its strong legs and strengthened caudofemoralis muscle allowing it to run at great speeds in order to reach prey, giving it a body plan eerily similar to that of a theropod dinosaur. Eventually, Alocanis sauromorpha crossed the Beringia land bridge, reaching the new world. While nowadays inhabiting a large territory, it has been more often seen around Yukon, a particularly dramatic sighting having happened near Patridge Creek, where it was first described. In this habitat, the so-called monster of Patridge Creek thrives due to the huge amounts of space, water and food that easily sustain its size even at larger populations. This predator's long, dense fur coat allows it to resist the cold climates of its natural habitat. While the usual climate of the Yukon is not as cold as in other regions, cold snaps can be extremely cold, which this creature's huge size and dense fur allow it to survive. Its dark color helps disguise it among the forest's vegetation where it stalks its prey. While mammoths have now become extinct, Alocanis saromorpha now survives by feeding on moose and caribou, prey big and abundant enough to support its huge size. While not considered to be endangered, Alocanis saromorpha's habitat is constantly shrinking due to human expansion and activity, which severely limits its hunting territory. This puts the creature dangerously close to human populations, and it might be only a matter of time before it starts seeing either domestic animals or humans themselves as a possible source of food. And that's it for a speculative biology look into the monster from Patridge Creek. Now let's address the mammoth in the room. Why did I just not make this creature a surviving dinosaur? While this one could have more easily been a dinosaur than, say, the Mokel Mbembe or the Ropen, I still didn't want to use an actual ceratosaur as its basis. As the channel focuses on reimagining fictional creatures as real animals, it made a lot more sense to think an animal could have evolved similarly to a dinosaur than have an actual dinosaur survive extinction. Plus, it's more fun to imagine a whole new organism with these characteristics than just making a dinosaur. That's why, going forward, I will usually refuse to use dinosaurs as a basis, unless a work of fiction is specifically based on a different world than our own, and the creature involved is more than just a dinosaur, like in Yoshi's case. Anyway, I hope you guys like the end result. And remember, if there's any type of creature you would like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, 
please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.